Okay, so backup power. Um, what I'm going to be covering today uh, needs some context. What I'm going to be covering today is deployable emergency backup power and um, planning for it in the context of a major incident, not a minor two or three day power outage like we just went through. But the idea is, is if you're going to spend money, if you're going to buy equipment and make plans, uh, why not go a little extra and make a plan for a major incident? So that's the difference between planning for two or three days without power and planning for two or three weeks, maybe as many as four weeks without power. And uh, keeping in mind that in a major incident, not only are you not going to have power for maybe three or four weeks, but you're also not going to have cell service, possibly not water, possibly not gas. Um, so uh, it's a little bit more involved, but the ideas are exactly the same, whether you're planning for a, an eight hour power outage or a, a month long power outage. The, the, the ideas are basically the same, but that's the context in which we'll be addressing this. So um, some people have been thinking about whole house solutions, like hooking their entire house up to uh, natural gas uh, lines and uh, <clears throat> or propane or uh, a solar whole solar house solution. And um, that's a little bit beyond the scope of what I'm going to be covering, but we can talk about that in the discussion afterwards, if you'd like. The most important thing to understand off right off the bat is that when you're thinking about a generator, and that's the go-to machine that most of us uh, are considering when, when we need backup power. If you're thinking about a generator, it's important to understand that there are actually two different kinds of generator, and the difference is significant. The, uh, the standard, simple, old school generator uh, and what's called an inverter. Now, sometimes these will be marketed under the, they'll be called uh, inverter generators. Sometimes they're just called inverters. Um, but there's an important difference between <clears throat> a plain generator and an inverter. A generator, a plain simple generator produces uh, 120 volts of AC current in a very raw, unfiltered form. Now, this is OK for uh, refrigerators and large appliances, washing machines, whatever. Uh, this raw AC current will run them just fine, but it is not going to be useful for sensitive electronics or uh, medical equipment, for example. Um, the, the energy, the, the power that's coming out of a simple generator is called a modified sine wave. and um, it's kind, of, uh, it's kind of dirty and noisy, and uh, it's not going to play nice with your laptops and your phones and any sophisticated, uh, delicate medical equipment you might need to run. Now, an inverter, on the other hand, also generates, it's an engine just like a regular generator, but it generates a raw alternating current as well, but then it immediately converts it internally to direct current, to DC. And... Once, it, once it's converted to DC, it basically cleans up that, that signal. It uh, filters it. And uh, then once it's all cleaned up, it reconverts it back to alternating current so that it can poop it out the front of the uh, generator, of the inverter. But what comes out of an inverter generator is what's called pure sine wave um, AC. And it's a significant difference. And to, to give you an idea what you see here in that nice, smooth blue line is pure sine wave, okay? Doesn't that look happy and gentle and smooth and easy? And then you see in that red or, oh my, is it chartreuse? It looks like it might be chartreuse. Anyway, the red modified sine wave is all squared off, right? So you can see that the difference between the two kinds of energy that comes out of either a simple generator or a pure sine wave inverter is significant, even though, as you can see, the amplitude of the two waves is exactly the same and the frequency of the two waves is exactly the same. But that modified sine wave has that steep climb, a flat plateau, a steep drop off. The, the modified sine wave that comes out of a, a standard simple generator is uh, a lot noisier and it, it creates what's called harmonic distortion. And the upshot of that is, is that it generates a lot of heat, it generates way more heat than an inverter. And that heat is essentially wasted energy. So it's reducing your, 
the efficiency uh, of the current that's coming out. And it also, uh, it's hard on equipment, even on a refrigerator or even on appliances that will be perfectly happy and run just fine on a generator. They're going to suffer more wear and tear if they're run off of a, a modified sine wave simple generator than if they're run from a pure sine wave uh, inverter. So obviously you've already figured out that the way to go here is probably for most people in most instances, an inverter. And um, you can save, depending on the comparison, you can save up to 40% in the efficiency by going with an inverter over a simple generator. So again, if you're thinking a plan for a long-term outage, that's going to make a big difference in the amount of fuel that you have to uh, store and provide for an extended outage. If you've got it a, 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 up to a 40% increase in efficiency, that's, that's a pretty big difference. So now beyond the decision between a, a simple generator and an inverter generator, the next thing that you have to consider is the fuel type and the storage of said fuel. Now, the most common fuel type for uh, generators and inverters is, of course, gasoline, petroleum gasoline. Now, with a generator, a simple generator, they're going to usually have a larger uh, fuel tank. So they're, they're designed to be able to run for a longer operating time. Uh, but this will make them uh, generally larger and less portable. An inverter is usually going to be smaller and uh, it'll be more portable, easier to move around, but it's going to have a smaller gas tank on it and it will need to be refueled more often. If you go with a gas powered generator or inverter, um, one of the things that you're going to want to also have is a siphon. And you can get one of these for about $20 with a bulb so that you don't have to be sucking on a, on a hose and get gas in your mouth. You get a, a $20 bulb siphon so that you can take gasoline from your vehicle if you have a gas powered vehicle or from your neighbor's vehicles if you have an extended outage and you want to run your generator and you've run out of your emergency fuel, you can get fuel from literally hundreds of cars in Laurel Canyon that have uh, tanks filled with gasoline, but you need that siphon to be able to do that. And storing gasoline requires the use of a stabilizer, which is very easy to do. For a five gallon can of gasoline, you put about two ounces of uh, something like Stabil or one of those uh, gasoline additives, and that will give you, uh, they say up to two year uh, storage before the gas goes bad. I, uh, I usually, change mine out after a year. What I do is I, I take the year old gas and I put it in my truck and I just use it in my truck and then take the empty can and uh, refill it with fresh gas, add stabilizer. And now I've got another year before I have to worry about it. So gasoline is the most common choice, whether it's an inverter or a, uh, an old school simple generator, but there's some things to consider. You're going to have to store that gas, use a stabilizer and have a siphon on hand so that you can get more. Um, another option is propane. And I think I can comfortably say that uh, you want to avoid a propane only inverter. Um, they do make them. Some of them are awful cute and they will run a small piece of equipment for a relatively short period of time. But uh, propane is not the ideal. Uh, way to go uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, liquid propane itself as a fuel uh, has a lower BTU output. It simply stores less potential energy per volume in liquid propane than in uh, petroleum gasoline. So that means that you're looking at with propane, you're looking at a higher fuel cost and the necessity to store more of it. Um, major consideration with propane as well again we're planning for a 30 day outage is that once those tanks are empty there's no way to refill them um home depot is not going to be open after you know two weeks after an earthquake so uh avoid the propane only um this is an example if you think about the standard propane tank that most people know that's that 20 pounder right that people have underneath their grills, or you see them on trailers for, for camp, campers and RVs, that 20 pound can uh, of liquid propane will run a generator or an inverter for about five hours on 50% load. So if you have an inverter and you're running it at 50% capacity, 
a 20 pound tank will keep that generator going for five hours. <clears throat> so if you do the math on that and you want to have enough propane to make it 30 days, you're talking about, again, on relatively low load, you're talking about in the neighborhood of 600 pounds of propane that you're going to need to store. Um, that's a lot of propane. That's a lot of, a lot of tanks. So avoid the propane only uh, inverters unless, again, unless you have a very specific strange situation. Um, but they do, however, make uh, what are called hybrids or dual fuel uh, inverters. And uh, these could be a good solution for certain people. The most popular kind are gas propane hybrids. So these are inverters that will run off of both propane and gasoline. You just change the switch on the, on the front of it and it will run off of either fuel. So this gives you an option to have uh, just a couple of those 20 pound propane tanks that you can store that if you have a short term outage of a day, two days, three days, like we just had, then you can easily and cleanly and quickly connect one of your 20 pound tanks to that inverter, get it up and running, keep your refrigerator from uh, spoiling and um, charge up your laptops and do all that stuff, knowing that within a couple of days at most, power is going to be restored. And even if it isn't, even if it stretches into a fourth day, Home Depot is still open because Home Depot has power. So you can get in your car and you can drive and you can refill your propane tanks. So for a short term solution, propane inverters are not bad at all. They're really easy. You don't have to worry about spilling gas, They're very clean, um, but for short term only. But then if you have this dual fuel generator and you have a longer situation, you can also have petroleum gasoline stored um, and keep that on hand for the longer term um, outages. So uh, gas propane hybrid could be a solution for, for some people. Now, they do also make generators inverters that run off of natural gas. And uh, some people might have a use for a generator like that, but that's only going to be as part of a more complex, uh, broader emergency power situation. Because if you're just buying one inverter, one machine, one engine to generate your emergency backup power, you do not want it to depend on natural gas only. Okay, because when we have earthquakes, what's one of the most common things that happens? The gas come, shuts off, the gas lines are damaged, or the gas company has to shut the gas off because maybe your gas lines are okay, but somebody nearby has a rupture and now they're shutting off gas mains. So it's very, very common. It's expected in any kind of a major earthquake for there to be interruption of natural gas. So you do not want to have your only backup power option depending on natural gas. You may have a situation where <clears throat> you can coordinate having a, a, a natural gas uh, generator that also uh, teams up with uh, an inverter or maybe two inverters or maybe a dual fuel, but a standalone natural gas generator is a bad idea if it's all you have. Now that you've chosen either a generator or an inverter, and you've chosen the kind of fuel that you're going to have, what you need to figure out is what's the capacity? How much juice do you need to come out of that motor? Okay, so what you have to uh, consider is, is that an inverter, which again is going to work for most people, but they max out at around 4,000 watts. I think you can get 4,000 or 4,500 uh, starting watts on some machines now, but they start getting pretty pricey the more the more uh, output that you get from an inverter. Um, now, simple generators, old school generators, the modified sine wave generators, those things can go up as high as 50,000 watts. Okay, this is what you're seeing. You see road work, road crews with the big lights and the generators, that thing, it's on a trailer. It's so big. Okay, so simple generators can get really, really big. Um, probably unlikely that that many people in the canyon have an equipment use um, that would require something like that in an emergency but that's that's how it breaks out uh, simple generators have higher capacity inverters max out around 4,000 watts um, so what you have to figure out is you have to figure out how much are you going to need and unfortunately and i say unfortunately because uh, i failed math three times in high school so I don't like math, 
but unfortunately you have to do some math here um, if you want to make sure that you're getting the right inverter for your purposes. And um, what you have to do is figure out what you're going to need to run, refrigerator, deep freezer, uh, do you want to be able to run your entertainment consoles, CD player, uh, television, charge up laptops, etc. And importantly, do you want to run something like a portable air conditioner or a portable space heater? Okay, remember those two things. If you have a portable space heater or a portable air conditioner that's part of your plan, you can save some math. But if you don't, if you have to figure out what your math is, there's a very simple equation. You only have to know one equation, and that is amps times volts equals watts. Okay, amps times volts equals watts. Now, it's easy because we always know what volts is. Volts is always going to be 120. Okay, and what we're trying to solve for is watts. We want to know how many watts our refrigerator requires, for example. So we know that the volts is 120 because that's the voltage that's coming out of the generator. It's the voltage that comes out of your wall. So all we need to do is find out how many amps that particular appliance requires. And the way to do that is to walk over to your refrigerator and open the door and look for the little plaque on the inside somewhere. Somewhere inside there's a little plaque that's gonna tell you. In the case of my refrigerator, uh, it draws three amps. So for my refrigerator, I have three times 120 equals 360 watts. Now, this is a generalization. You have to understand a refrigerator does not draw 360 watts from the moment you plug it in, you know, for hours on end. Most things have a surge of energy that they will draw from a generator or an inverter first. For example, when you first plug in a refrigerator and that compressor goes on, the compressor is going to draw a surge of energy, maybe as high as five or 600 watts initially, depending on how old your refrigerator is. So it's going to draw a surge of power initially to start up. And then once the compressor is running, the load that it requires is going to drop down significantly over time. But to do this equation, this gets you in the ballpark of having a general idea of how much power a given appliance is going to need. Okay. Now a space heater, this is why if you're a space heater or a portable air conditioner is part of your plan, why it saves you math. A space heater or a portable air conditioner draws a lot of power. Okay. And in all likelihood, whatever you have in your plan, if you have a space heater in there, that's going to be the thing that's going to draw the more the most power. So you just need to go to that space heater, find the label and read how many watts it draws. The one that I have is a sealed oil space heater. It draws 1600 watts. Okay. That's a lot of power. 1600 watts. So once I know I have a space heater with 1600 watts, it really doesn't matter how many amps my refrigerator or my freezer pull uh, because I have to find a generator that's going to run my space heater. I have to find an inverter that's going to run my space heater. So um, that helps. Now, when I mentioned earlier about uh, a surge, this is another important thing to know about capacity and generators and inverters when you're picking them out. You'll see two numbers generally on most uh, machines. It'll say uh, starting watts and running watts, um, or it'll say uh, surge watts and running watts. Usually it's starting and running watts. Um, the starting watt is what it refers, it's what it's referring to the capacity that it will put out for that momentary surge of, of load that might be drawn from your refrigerator's compressor starting up. So for a short period of time, for example, my generator will put out 2200 watts, but its running wattage is 1800 watts. Right now, I picked it out because I had determined that the uh, space heater was the piece of equipment that was going to draw the most power. So 1600 watts was my target. I wanted to have more than 1600 watts capacity. So I had some room. So I got an 1800 running watts generator. Some people will see these things and they'll say, oh, it's a 2000, uh, it's a XXX 2000 uh, inverter and think that it's got 2000 
watts output. It generally doesn't. When, when, when there's a number as part of the model number, that number is usually the starting watts because they're marketing and they want you to think, oh, it's got 2000 watts of power. Well, that's starting watts. It will give you 2000 watts for a short period of time. What you need to know, what are the running watts? And a 2000 starting watt generator or inverter is generally gonna give you 1600 running watts or in that area, okay? So figuring out the capacity of the generator that you're going to need um, can be made easier if you also make a plan for how that load is going to be distributed. For example, are you going to put everything on your inverter all at once? Are you going to need to run a refrigerator, a freezer, uh, a space heater, uh, charge your laptops, run a chicken coop? I don't know. Are, do, are you going to have to run everything all at the same time? Probably not. Um, so what you can do is you can figure out a plan for how you will keep your powered equipment in service that doesn't involve having to draw a maximum number of watts at all time. And then that way you can figure out what's the maximum amount of load that I'm going to need to draw from my emergency generator or my emergency inverter. And then you can buy one with that capacity. Um, for me, I stagger the load. So I say, okay, the power goes out, right? Note the time. Find out as soon as I can, what's the source of the power outage? Oh, okay, it's gonna last a couple of days. Or if the ground has just stopped shaking, stopped shaking, then I know what the cause of the power outage is. So I will stage my generator out on the patio, get it ready to go, but I don't need to hook up that refrigerator right away, do I? I've in fact got about four hours before my refrigerator is going to need power. So what I'll do is if, uh, if it's the winter time and I need to warm up a room, I'll move the, the sealed oil heater into uh, the guest room and I'll warm that room up. So make sure I have at least one warm room. And then as it comes up on three or four hours since the outage, I'll take the heater off of the generator or the inverter and I'll move it into the kitchen and plug in the refrigerator. I'll run the refrigerator for roughly a half an hour to top it back off again, as long as the doors have not been opened. Uh, with my deep freezer, I don't need to worry about that for up to 24 hours. As long as it's packed full all the way to the top, I don't have to worry about it for 48 hours. So I'm not really gonna be worrying about running uh, an extension cord down uh, to the laundry room to get to my deep freezer for a day or two. So I can stagger the load so that I know that with a 1800 running watt gasoline power generator, I can handle all of the things that I'm going to need for an extended up to 30 day power outage. Okay. Now, some people are going to employ multiple generators. That's an option for some people. I have two of them really, again, because of the R word redundancy. I just want to have a second one in case the first one poops out in an emergency. So we have two uh, inverters and, um, and we're all set. Uh, oh, one other thing, however, that you want to make sure you have is you want to make sure you have sufficient cables, sufficient proper gauge extension cords to get from your generator to your appliances. So you're going to want to go for 14 gauge or higher, which actually means a lower number. So 14 or 12 gauge extension cords um, and make sure you have a long enough run to be able to get from wherever you have to put your generator outside to wherever you need the power to run inside, okay? And the last thing is that to understand that whatever you do, whether you get a generator or an inverter, this is a motor. It's a motor that's generating electricity. It's dangerous, okay? The two primary hazards that come from a generator or an inverter are carbon monoxide poisoning and a fire hazard, okay? So you have to be very, very serious and never slack off when you're operating generators, even if it's two, three weeks into an extended emergency, you have to treat that generator or that inverter with respect because it's a dangerous piece of equipment. It should never be left unattended. Um, and you should always have a fire extinguisher nearby when you're operating a generator. Now there's, uh, there's a, a, a section in the, in the LSEP in the Laurel Canyon emergency plan that, that covers this. I think it's page 65. Um, so you can uh, read up on power outages and generators in the Laurel Canyon Emergency Plan on page 65. It doesn't go into detail on generators the way I just did now, but it's got a lot of the safety information on there. 
Um, and one last thing, you're not going to believe that I have to say this, but I have to say this <clears throat> because it actually happens. If you get a generator or an inverter, understand that you cannot take an extension cord and plug it into your inverter and then run that cord into your living room and plug it into the wall to feed power <laughs> into your house. I know, I know, right? Who would do that? Sadly, <laughs> a lot of people do that. And there are people who get electrocuted and there are people who burn down their houses. I've got Jim Moore on here, who's a veteran electrician. Jim, you've heard of this probably, right? You've heard of people backfeeding. Yeah, and also I want to uh, uh, clarify something you said. If you're running an extension cord from a generator, I would recommend at least 10 gauge, not 14. You, because that's a, that's a long way. So you want to derate the wire because uh, it will transmit heat, which can cause a fire or a failure. So at least 10 gauge when you're, when you're feeding a generator. And maybe even higher. If you, it, the rule of thumb is if you're going 50 feet, 10 gauge. If you're going 100 feet, it was probably good to derate the wire even more. But, uh, and as far as uh, power goes for a 20 amp uh, breaker, you could probably run a large appliance like a refrigerator and a light or two on it. But the rule of thumb is for startup capacity on a 20 amp breaker, you don't want to exceed 80%. Okay, so it, it, startup is fine to reach that point. But when you're, uh, whatever you're running on your generator, you don't want to exceed 80% of capacity. That's a good rule to remember and you'll be safe. Yeah, and, and the, the thing to remember that's tricky is that when you're talking about gauge, wire gauge, a bigger, thicker wire is a smaller number. Okay, it's a little, little backwards. So a 12, a a 12 gauge ca a cable is going to be thicker than a 14 gauge. A 10 gauge will be thicker, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When, uh, Jim's an electrician. He's an expert. His life depends on understanding <laughs> what the best way is to do it. If Jim says 10, go 10. Um, well, 12 gauge is certainly better than what some people do where, where they would just run a common extension cord from their generator to feed something. And right. people, that's going to radiate a lot of heat and heat is, causes electrical fires. So you really don't want to do that. That's a lot of transfer from point A to point B. So right. you want wire that's going to handle the, that transfer. And uh, in a standard uh, uh, extension cord that's in your home, that's not going to cut it. That's a, that's a fire looking for a place to happen. It's, um, it's kind of what I was talking about earlier, the difference between a generator and an inverter. Um, the, the, the movement of electricity from point A to point B always involves a certain amount of heat loss. It's unavoidable. Mm -hmm. And that's why a, a simple generator versus an inverter creates more heat because the 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 signal is not it's 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 that modified sine wave. It's got that square shape. It's not as efficient. It doesn't travel through the through the cable as as nicely as smoothly. So it generates more heat. So uh, heat obviously can be dangerous if you have a, a an undergaged cable running over flammable material, that's not a good thing. And I'll say if anybody on the team, any ECT members have any questions or, or, or problems putting together their emergency power plan, I'd be more than happy to, to help you out. Give me a, shoot me an email or give me a call. I'll help you out. If you have a question that I can't answer, we got Jim. And I'll call up Jim and we'll get Jim to answer the, uh, the higher end uh, electro boy uh, questions that are beyond my uh, my skills. Now, the only other thing I want to mention before we go into a, a, a question and, and answer and discussion is that in addition to having, you know, a, a plan for, for an inverter, um, it really still is a good idea to just have a lot of batteries, man. Just you can never have too many batteries. Have batteries, batteries, batteries for everything that, that runs in your house, for kids' toys, for mom's hearing aid, for your smoke detectors, for your TV remote, for everything, just have batteries. 
and then also have some of these battery packs, these portable things that you can throw in your bag and use to recharge your phone. Those can come in really handy. Um, they also make these very inexpensive and very effective solar chargers that are like the size of a coffee table book, right? You fold it open, set it on the table out on the patio, plug your cell phone into it, and two hours later, your cell phone is recharged, okay? So have other options um, to your, your inverter or your generator. Have other ways to go um, and things that you can add to supplement and reduce the amount of load that you're going to need to be demanding from your inverter or from your generator. So again, just a quick review. For most people, an inverter is going to be the way to go. For most people, most situations, a gasoline powered inverter is going to be the way to go. It's going to be less expensive. It's going to be less fuel to store, and it's going to be more efficient uh, use of the energy. Um, for most people who just want to run a refrigerator and a light and a couple of other things like that, a mid-sized 2000 starting watt, 1600 running watt inverter generator is going to do the job. Okay, it's going to provide enough to keep your food from spoiling in your refrigerator to charge up your laptops because it's an inverter, it's pure sine wave AC coming out of it, so it's not going to damage any of your um, uh, devices. That's going to be the way to go. Now, once you start having a higher demand, a higher load, now you have to start doing some math. You just have to start making a plan and thinking about staggering your loads. But again, for a basic, I don't want my food to spoil. I want to be able to recharge my laptop and my tablets for my kids. You can get that set up with gas cans, a siphon, and uh, your inverter, and fill the tank up for five or six hundred dollars. And that'll pay for itself probably after a couple of simple multi-day power outages. That'll have paid for itself in, in food that you won't be replacing from your refrigerator and your freezer. Um, all right. So, and oh, just the one last thing. Again, I can't believe I have to say it, but, but based on some things I saw that were pointed out to me uh, on the Facebook uh, group, never use candles. Oh. No candles in a power outage. Okay. Oh. Never. Never use candles. The stats on this are simply undeniable. And we all think that we're smart people and we won't do something stupid, but the stats say otherwise. The stats say, in point of fact, we're all mostly morons and we will do something stupid, okay? Of house fires caused by burning candles between, I forget the years, but it was like a big chunk of time. It was like 2012. 2012 to 2016. It was at least four, a four year span. This was from the NFPA. Of all of the house fires that were caused by candles, 70% of those candle house fires occurred during power outages. Okay, it's just a fact. Don't use candles, especially for an extended outage. The odds increase that you're going to nod off and fall asleep. Now a candle's burning unattended. You're going to get distracted, go to another room, forget that you left a candle burning in the other room. Now a candle's burning unattended. You have a dog, dog comes by, knocks it over, has no idea what's going on. Next thing you know, your house is on fire. So now you not only have no power, but now you have your house on fire. No candles. Okay, so have your generator set up, have your battery backups, and do not use candles. But this, this, is, <laughs> this has just reminded me of something. Karen, Karen thank you for pointing out that unusual refrigerator because it just reminded me of something that actually is really a common issue with people who are trying to power their refrigerators off of inverters and that is a lot of people have built-ins and they go out and they get a generator and they get a, an extension cord and they start up their generator and they run the extension cord into their kitchen and they realize they don't have access to the plug for the refrigerator it's a built-in. It's behind it. Now they need two, two 240 pound guys and a furniture dolly to move that refrigerator out of the built-in so that they can access the refrigerator's power cable at the back. So you have to, might have to arrange, you might have to. No, because you can't move. You can't move it. It's built into the wall. Right. But, 
do you have access to the plug that it is it I'll have to check okay. when I can climb up it, it might be above above it but sometimes, I don't know sometimes sometimes it'll be hardwired see this is the it's, thing you have I, to I'm, do. I'm betting it's hardwired yeah yeah I would I would bet that it's hardwired well, I get one of those things that are called I think it's called a Jedi or Jetty and it's a keeps your food fresh in your car for like four days well, I mean, there are lots of things that you can do, Karen, but but again, as like I said at the beginning, the context of what I'm presenting and recommending today is preparing right. for the big one. Okay, if, we're, if you're prepared for a three or four week power outage, then you're going to be prepared for a three or four day power outage is the idea. And if you're going to spend the money and put the effort in, you might as well get prepared for that big major incident. And uh, and then all the other preparation, you know, will will fall into place. So, but what you might want to do, and what anybody who's considering running a refrigerator off of a off of a deployable emergency uh, inverter, is make sure you have access to the re refrigerator plug. <laughs> right? I mean, it's believe me, I had to actually when I set mine up, I had to actually move my refrigerator within the built-in, and then I had to get the the refrigerator's cable and connect it to a special appliance extension cord so that I could basically pull it along the side of the refrigerator so I could reach in to the little spot between the, the built-in wall and the refrigerator wall and grab the extension cord, pull it out, unplug it, and plug it into the extension cord from the generator, from the inverter, okay? So it's a very common thing. A lot of people, you know, have the built-ins or even don't have built-ins, they just don't have an easy way. Maybe the refrigerator is right next to the stove, is right next to a cabinet, whatever. You have to make sure that you have access to the plug if you want to plug it in. Al, did you say that somebody had a question about uh, solar generators? I think somebody, did somebody have a solar generator issue? I had a question about the solar generators, but um, okay. if that, you know, just because yeah, no, that's that's that, that that's actually a, a good thing because a lot of people um, get uh, uh, seduced by these uh, these really cute, uh, really nice, well-made uh, what they call solar generators. <clears throat> and the thing about these things is, is that they're not actually generators; they're they're a big, angry battery inside a cute little box with all sorts of connections, and they're very well made. And they can be very, very helpful and very useful in some circumstances. But what you have to understand is, is that if you go with one of these things, whether they call it a solar generator or a power bank, uh, whatever they call it, they're made by companies like Jackery and uh, Bluetti and um, uh, Renology uh, or Renergy. Anyway, a lot of companies are making them. There's a lot of competition for this. Uh, for this mar in this market now, what you have to keep in mind is it's basically it's just a battery. OK, so what you're buying is a big battery that has large capacity and you're going to be powering everything from a big battery that's then going to have to be recharged. OK, so let's say just for a common example, let's say you have uh, one of these all in ones. Right. And let's say you have a refrigerator. Okay, let's make this very, very simple. Let's say I have a refrigerator and I figured out that a refrigerator, if I do it on a staggered plan, is going to consume about 500 watt hours per day. Okay, and I'm going to get one of these solar generator all-in-ones that is based around a 100 amp hour battery at 12 volts. Okay, so that means that that all-in-one solar generator is going to provide me with, again, amps times volts equals watts. That's going to provide me with 100 amp hours at 12 volts is going to give me 1200 watt hours. And what that means is, is that that solar generator will give me an output of 1200 watts for one hour, or it will give me an output of one watt for 1200 hours. Okay, and of all the combinations in between. So when you're talking about watt hours, that's what that means. Uh, when you have a bulb, you say you have a 40 watt bulb. What that means is, is that that light bulb draws 40 watts per hour. OK, so now if we do the math, if we have a 500 watt hour per day refrigerator and we have a capacity in our solar power pack of 1200 watt hours, we can run that for probably two days. 
or thereabouts before the battery is going to need to be recharged. But at some point after probably a day or two, probably much less, that battery and that solar generator is going to have to be recharged. Now it's called a solar generator, right? So you think, oh great, as long as it's sunny, I can just plug it in. Okay, here comes more math. You have to know how much solar um, input you're going to need to put into that battery to recharge it. And the easiest way to do that is to think, okay, well, I have a 1200 watt hour capacity battery. The average amount of sun that is usable, again, average, but the average amount of sun that's usable in a given day is five hours. If I divide 1200 watt hours by five hours, that means I need solar panel output of 240 watts. Okay, that means I need three 100 watt panels in series, or I need two 160 watt panels in series to have more than the capacity that I need. Because again, remember what Jim said, whenever electricity is passing through wire, there's loss, there's heat loss, okay? That applies to any time electricity is passing through a wire. You're losing some of the juice when it passes through a wire. So now I have to have a solar array of 300 watt output, and I have to count on the fact that I'm going to get five hours or more of good sun per day in order to keep that solar generator powered up and running for more than a couple of days. Okay. So you've probably, you're probably a step ahead of me here. Yeah. Thank, thank you, James. So you're probably a step ahead of me here. But what that means is, is that even if you have a solar power bank, solar generator, whatever it's been called, you're going to need a gas generator to, to charge it up. <laughs> At the end of the day, you're still going to need that gasoline generator because after two, three, maybe four days, if you're lucky, even if there's sun, that solar power generator is going to be out of juice and you're not going to be able to plug it into the wall to charge it up because your power's out. So you're going to need a gas generator, a gas inverter in order to charge up your sexy, cute. And boy, they are cute. They are cute, sexy little devices, these things. You know, Blue Eddy, man, have you seen the Blue Eddies? Blue Eddy makes these really, really hot looking things. They're kind of retro. They're kind of future. They're kind of, they're really, really, you know, pretty things. And they look like they'd be fun to own. And they are. And they might do great. They might actually work into your plan. You might say, let me have one of those for the for the short term outage, right? Like we had just the other day. Man, let me have one of those blue eddies. I can pull it out of the closet. I can plug my refrigerator into it. I'm done. Two days later, I don't even have to deploy solar panels. Two, three days later, when the power comes back on, I just plug it into the wall and recharge the battery. It's just a battery. That's the thing you got to keep in mind. It's just a battery. These solar chargers are just a big old angry battery. So it's going to need to be recharged somehow, some way.